All right. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's an honor to um, present. And um, yeah, hopefully the talk isn't uh, too dry. And also, I just realized that there's a little goof with the title of this. That should be a capital A, because we're actually going to be talking about kind of a special notation that Baxter and Cigar used in their old Chinese reconstruction to mark some seemingly irregular developments of the vowel A. Um, in really Cheyun system Chinese. So we're gonna look at it from a different perspective and talk about it from um, Min historical phonology. So we have kind of three rough like final categories we're gonna talk about. Um, before that, I'll start with just a few words on um, a few problems in old Chinese reconstruction and just kind of a recap of you know what dialects will be comparing and Min classification and then a quick closing. Okay. Uh, so first, just a statement of the issue. So the in the Baxter and Cigar system in 2014, they have this capital A um, that marks chain system reflexes of old Chinese A ah that cannot be completely uh, explained by regular sound change. So what this means is that there's actually a few of them that seem like they're almost regular sound change. So this is particularly for the one that ends in K for like, um, uh, that would be duobu. Most of those seem like it's like a conditioned sound change, but there's a few exceptions to the rule that are hard to explain, so they mark it in that case. The other ones marked with A are a little bit more sporadic. Um, so they suggest that dialect mixture might have been responsible for this, and they give a few examples from Min Chinese, uh, particularly in the case of this uh, AK rhyme that I was just talking about. Um, so what I'm going to explore today is if all of these are the result of dialect mixture, or at least, you know, if we look at it from a different perspective, instead of the um, kind of middle Chinese perspective, we usually look at it from if we kind of discover anything different. Okay, um, so just a quick thing on some of the notation I've used here. Uh, and this kind of is something that I think it's glossed over a little bit when we talk about the pharyngealization hypothesis is in Norman's early Chinese, he has three different types of syllables and he treats it so that they are features of the entire syllable. You got pharyngealized syllables, retroflex syllables, and plain syllables. Baxter and Cigar have a four-way system where they have pharyngealized, um, which is type A in like the way that Polyblank talks about old Chinese versus type B, which is plain. And then there's a the presence of an R medial that can occur with either of them. If we try to convert back to Norman system, his class B, the retroflex syllables, only correspond to the pharyngealized ones with a medial R. Um, so the way I'm going to treat it here is mark it N for neutral, P for pharyngeal, then R if it's there or not. Uh, we're mainly concerned with neutral syllables today. Um, I won't treat cases where they have R in parentheses, where we can't really tell if there is an R or not. Um, and I'm not completely on board with where they reconstruct R and neutral syllables anyway, but fortunately it's not too important for this presentation. Okay. Um, so one other thing just for convenience again is gonna be talking about post codas. So post codas in old Chinese are the final S and glottal stop you've probably seen before. Um, they're reconstructed on the basis of deep Xiaosheng connections. I mean, orthographically deep. So this is probably an adaptation that was made in the writing system a really long time ago and doesn't seem as relevant for like the later um, writing system for when you have more like the Tongjia loans and that sort of thing in Warring States period. It's also kind of based on etymological connections. Um, so this is mostly irrelevant once you kind of move into the Warring States period and beyond it. So I'm not going to treat it um, for like every time I'll raise an old Chinese example. So we'll treat cases of PS and TS and then JS after high vowels as if they were just S. Um, K and then the postcode of S we'll treat as just H. Um, so this would be the same as if that K wasn't there at all. And we'll include these in our discussion of the U group, which is just A, ah, that could also be followed by a glottal stop or H in the way I'm doing it. 
um, rather than including it in discussion of the dual group. Um, same thing applies with this WK ending in the traditional Yao group. Um, we'll just treat it as WH and talk about it when we talk about Xiao. Actually, I don't think Xiao comes up in this presentation, but um, just so that we're clear on what I mean when I put an H there. Schusler has a way of doing this too, but his is slightly different where he does it by depending if the um, coda is coronal or not, then he has an S, so slightly different system. Okay, um, so now that the kind of technicalities are out of the way and hopefully my convention is readable, I'll move on and try to talk a little bit about something that's more interesting. Um, so Old Chinese and the modern dialect map. Um, these two don't really get discussed together, even though I think it's really important to be able to kind of evaluate our old Chinese in terms of actual Chinese dialects that are spoken today, rather than just looking at chain system reflexes that might be a little bit misleading or artificial in certain ways. Um, and especially when we have hypotheses about dialect mixture, um, sorry, I should just read mixture, not mixturing. Um, and this comes up quite frequently in the new reconstruction. We have certain developments that are somewhat sporadic. If we want to understand these, it'd be really helpful to have reconstructed dialect phonology and other kind of sources we can point to and say, this is the region where such and such a thing would have happened. It's a little bit idealistic. I don't know if we're ever going to be quite at that point, but at least we can kind of talk about you know, certain instances where there might be something to that. Um, this research is still in its early stages. We need to learn a lot more about um, just Chinese dialect phonology in general for like earlier stages of it, reconstructing it. Um, and it's kind of a painstaking process because when you're reconstructing Chinese dialect historical phonology, you really have to be careful about your how you construct cognate sets. Because if you have character readings essentially that come from different time periods and you're comparing them in a way that isn't how they actually came to the language and you can run into all sorts of problems. Um, so yeah, um, in any case, this kind of research on the um, historical phonology of dialects is crucial to our understanding of a full history of Chinese. Right now, our research is mainly focused on historical phonology, but in the future development of lexicon is probably really important for this issue as well. Um, just because there's such a huge break between what we see in the pre-Qin period versus the Han period in terms of just common words. Um, okay. Um, it's not letting me move forward one second. All right. Um, so in, in this discussion, I want to bring up briefly the, uh, this is an approximation of the dialect zones by um, W. South Coblin, uh, according to Fang Yen. And there's a few different approximations of this. I think um, some of the more recent maps will put the boundary for the Eastern versus Central dialects a little bit further to the West. Um, this is kind of a rough and ready version that we can use to talk about what the dialect situation would have been like at what um, Coblin calls the Han horizon. So this is a time in the Eastern Han period where philological evidence, so like Fanxia and then like the Buddhist transcriptions and then reconstructed dialect phonology coincide well enough that we get a pretty reasonable picture of what Chinese sounded like during that time period without having to resort to things that are more difficult to interpret, like rhymed texts or um, you know, character structure or stuff like that. Um, so the area we're going to focus on is, you know, Fujian. So we're looking at the um, southeastern area as well as, you know, anything that would have been called Jiangdong in that time period. So this kind of is where modern Wu dialects are spoken as well. Um, but what's also relevant to this discussion is going to be central, which is going to be kind of more related to what later becomes common dialectal Chinese, and then eastern, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, Okay, um, so we're going to have kind of four stages that we'll talk about in terms of dialect development in the Yangtze watershed. So we have what I just talked about, the Han horizon. So this is kind of before you have really heavy migration into this area. And it, what I just showed you for that kind of dialect map is roughly where we think things were at that time period, but still, you know, philologically based on, um, uh, you know, comparative like word list in the actual Fang Yen. Um, so after that, we have the post Yongjia period. Um, so we could roughly call this early middle Chinese, but I want to be really explicit that when I 
talk about early Chinese, I don't mean Cheyun system here. I mean, just like kind of the general time period around when Polly Blank called whatever he was reconstructing early middle Chinese. Um, so this is not just the central speakers in terms of what we're going to be talking about for Jiangdong or like Min development. It probably also involves Eastern dialect settlers. That would have been from Jiang, um, Jiangsu or Shandong. Um, we might call this trans Yangzi, and this is kind of the Han horizon and the post Yongjia um, layers are very important for understanding the kind of formation of the basic Min lexicon. Uh, we also have post Anshu, uh, which would be more like late Middle Chinese time, and then post Jingkang, which are comparatively probably less important, although I still think there's an, a lot of influence from post Anshu. Um, so we could. Some hypotheses for like comparative Min Chinese is we probably expect to see lexical layers present from all three stages. Um, it seemed they seem to bear a close relationship to Southern Wu dialects. Um, something that's interesting that I've noticed recently is they seem to have absorbed some of the Eastern dialect features, um, but they probably didn't descend directly from Eastern dialects. So one thing that's kind of infamous now is this R to J change that this was in the New Reconstruction book. It was a Sound change was originally proposed by Strosten. Um, but th this research on um, kind of the interchange between Gu and Yuan and uh, Wei and Wen, these like uh, rhyme groups, has been around for a really long time. Um, like Lin Yutang was looking at this well, and he also kind of pinned it on this Eastern Western divide. So there's a few words in um, the dialects around this area that suggest this change. So we have the common min uh, doi for, for like Duan short, uh, that also is in this uh, proto Chu Qi, um, which is a southern Wu. It's a reconstruction by Akitani Hiroyuki. Um, so we have a cognate there. There's a bunch more in this um, PNECQ. Um, so we have drill, sour, and front all seem to take this E. And this isn't just like denasalization, because you can also reconstruct nasal codas and like nasalized vowels in this uh, particular proto system. So th these really do seem like they came from some kind of coda like this. Um, yeah. Um, but anyway, in the earliest layers of the um, Min dialects, we have a lot of non-central Han horizon stuff that um, exhibit a few old Chinese-like features. We kind of are able to look beyond what the mainstream Han horizon would have looked like. So we'll talk about that in a more in a minute. Um, so uh, for this talk, the materials I'm going to be using is first coastal min. So mainly I use uh, Guokbichi's proto-southern uh, min reconstruction. Where I can't get uh, cognates, I have taken the Jinjiang dialect as described by Li Rulong. Um, for eastern min, we have Fuqing. Um, what I was using when I was making this presentation was Norman's white pages data for it. I would probably need to get this from a better source if I'm going to publish this, so I'll, I'll work on that later. Um, this is just to have like a rough and ready data to show you. Um, and then Proto Ningdo by Akitani Hiroyuki. Um, for the inland languages, we have uh, Central Min, so I'll be using Yongan again from the white pages. Um, Northern Min, there are reconstructions available. Um, so we have Sun Shun's reconstruction. And Norman's much earlier than that. Um, but there's still a little bit of disagreement exactly how the final should be reconstructed. Uh, so just to kind of give a rough idea, I provided the um, Zeno Diko and Shibe dialects, both um, collected by Akitani. I also have done this on purpose because these are the dialects that um, Shen Rui Qing et al. used in their discussion of you know, really similar problems. I want it to be very comparable. Um, we also have the, uh, for the Xiaojiang area, I have uh, Xiao Wu Heping also in the white pages. Okay, so uh, this is a fuzzy clustering of the Min dialects I did a little while back, where I, I this is uh, based on dialectometry. So I, I measured phonetic distances of all the Min dialects and then cluster them together. Um, so this is kind of a rough representation of how that turned out. Um, we can divide Min into like two big areas. We have coastal versus inland. The coastal ones are going to be in the blue and the purple. I've put little red arrows. It's probably too small to read. Um, but I put one pointing to Jinjiang um, for the southern Min, where it is in kind of like that teal area. And then I've put another one pointing to Jiudu. That's kind of 
approximating the proto Ningde, um, another one pointing the Futing. And then down past that, um, sorry, before I move on from a coastal mean, one thing in here is that the uh, Pusian dialects are pretty closely clustered with um, Southern Min. So I, I didn't put an extra point um, just kind of for brevity. There's only so much I can fit on these slides. Um, and it's not too different from Proto-Southern Min. Um, we also have the um, Yoshi dialects are seem to be clustering with uh, coastal min, but they're kind of far outside. I kind of think they might be a little bit of a contact zone, so I also didn't include them. Um, in inland min, we have um, Surbayan uh, decode there. Uh, Yongan uh, for the central min is just a little bit outside of that. And then we have Heping, which is actually in this clustering, the Xiaojiang dialects don't, they kind of seem to be parallel to the um, Inland Min, but it's not too important for our purposes. I, I think that the general grouping of Inland Min is pretty valid. Um, if we put it on a map, those colors kind of look like this. To compare this, this is kind of a rough like chopping of what Fujian province looks like with a little bit of um, Guangdong thrown in there. For a more traditional map, we can compare it to um, Deng Xiangjiang's uh, dissertation. We have this nice picture that kind of shows all the areas. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving forward, but hopefully you can get a rough idea of the places I'm gonna be talking about. So um, first and foremost, we have our capital AK rhyme. Um, so first we wanna date this split of the door group. Um, and this is something that gets conflated with, there's a general kind of, um, coalescence in the Eastern Han period of the Yang and Gung groups, so Ang and Eng, and then the parallel Rusheng ones, the Ak and Ek. Um, these seem to have been conditioned by a medial R. This change is actually separate from that, and it happens much later. So this is probably in the Western Xun period. This is a Zhou Zumo's study of like all the rhymes from that time period. It's So I'm pretty wary of rhyme data when I do reconstructions, just because I think that rhyme identity doesn't necessarily guarantee that it has the exact same vowel and final, just that they were kind of close. But if things tend not to rhyme, then it tells you that there was some kind of phonetic change going on here. So this split is fairly reliable. Um, anyway, so this is the one that Baxter and Cigar mentioned in connection with Min. Essentially, for these neutral syllable ak, when we have a coronal initial that is not retroflex in like Chain system and later, these ones tend to front. So probably there was some kind of medial that was pulling it forward. So something like shi for stone would have been something like jiak originally getting pulled more forward to like a jiak type of sound and starting to rhyme with like the ek rhymes. Um, Min Chinese is interesting because it reflects the pre yongjia situation where this is not a thing. They, they all have kind of one identity. So I'll show some examples of words um, that have the pre-split retention. Um, whoops, that sugar cane shouldn't be there at the front, but the rest of it's all fine. Um, we have, uh, so like ruler, this uh, chop um, will all be like with this kind of back all vowel. Yao at the very end there for medicine being like a yaw type of a sound is not from this particular rhyme group. I just wanted to demonstrate that there are other words that this, you know, that would fit into where it's kind of more like the Cheyenne system. Um, Baxter would write it at J-A-K rhyme. Um, th this is the Yao rhyme in Cheyenne system. Um, so the, these all kind of rhyme together. In an interesting case, another one would be the um, Zhu here. So this Diao, which would be like correct. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, this is Norman's common min. So if you're wondering why there's uh, not the voiced consonants at the beginning with the uh, Yang root tones, that, that's why. Um, uh, yeah, so that one stays with like this uh, Yao rhyme in Xiaoyun because it's a retroflex initial. Um, but in Min, these all just kind of uh, rhyme together. Um, Something that's interesting here, though, is so, huh, I'm not sure why this Dua has been put at the front there, but that's okay. Um, 
all the ones from the Yao Bu in Min, these words tend to be in a different rhyme category that's actually more forward. So this is not the situation that we expect for Cheyun system or um, common dialectal Chinese. So um, like the the uh, for like a, a sparrow would probably you know be more of an yok like rhyme where it's actually front in common min where it's tiak instead. The same thing for like carving something, the xue uh, would be tiak. Um, so this is actually a, um, a completely different innovation in min. So while we had a retention before, this is an innovation that I think is, I haven't seen this be talked about in a lot of places. So um, anyway, we have this yao being merged with the xi group, but we have jack and zek for like spine and like the classifier for animals. Um, um, yeah, so just kind of a, a recap of um, what I was discussing here is we, we have um, essentially a retention. So it doesn't necessarily say anything about the dating of Min um, by preserving this dual group with like a back more yok like vowel. Um, but the split of this yao is something that we think happened very early in like Han rhyming history. So it being merged with Xi is interesting in this way that it, it seems like we have a split of min pretty early on when the yao category, this elk and like elk like rhymes were probably still separate. Um, so I think we should be mindful of this type of innovation. Okay. Um, but the, the point with this was this capital A that Baxter and Cigar have put here is mostly reconstructable just by, I mean, um, accountable just by uh, the type of initial. And in the few cases where we have mixture, there's no like split at all in Min dialects. So probably what happened is when you have central dialect speakers moving over to the Eastern region. So after, you know, Western Jin, this is after the Yongjiao period, you, there's probably a lot of disagreement in how you pronounce the finals of these groups. So there's a little bit of noise there um, in chain system and um, in, you know, in real dialect pronunciation too for like um, common dialectal Chinese. Okay. Uh, we'll revisit the Ak group when we talk about just A by itself in a minute. Um, but now we'll move on. So this is the Gu group um, with the capital A. So we can also get a rough estimate of when the Gu group split off. So in Koblen's study of uh, Chang'an rhymes, he observed so that pharyngeal and neutral syllables of the Gu group began to stop rhyming as frequently at the end of the Western Han period. And by the Eastern Han period, the pharyngeal syllables, um, oh, sorry, that should read N instead. I, I kept thinking plain in my head. The neutral syllables began to rhyme with the Jia group. So you have this like I becoming E. Eh. Um, um, in the central dialects, this is like, you know, what common dialectal Chinese and other things are based on, we have the um, pharyngeal syllables losing their J coda. So we have, you know, gu, although it's something more like a guy becoming a ga, like a type of sound. Um, uh, while the neutral syllables are monophonizing from like an I to an E type of sound. Um, what's interesting is that the colloquial words in Min and many other Southeastern dialects show very little trace of these developments. Um, so we have like, Po for broken in the uh, chu chu like reconstructed pronunciation, but like a pi type of sound. Um, um, so we can see this in the correspondences for uh, min as well, um, and the the capital A doesn't really tell us which reflex we're going to get. So all the way up until yeah, all of those have the same common mean final. Um, the phonophoric component of chi is in paper. Looks like it suggests an E in old Chinese, um, but the data here suggests that it might've came from I, and there's also evidence from Southeast Asian language that kind of point in that direction too. So that's why I uh, put that question mark there. Um, the coda, interestingly enough, has been lost in um, 
coastal min, for instance. Um, but because of the reflexes in inland min, we can tell that there's been monothingization. So it makes the most sense to reconstruct that final um, coda there. Uh, yeah, but the point is that the word for snake, sure, um, doesn't uh, behave in a different way than the rest of the reflexes. We do have ye yeah by itself, but that's probably a later loan. We also have li, um, which has like a ye yeah type of rhyme. So this is getting kind of more into the jia category for old Chinese. Um, but this might come from like a post Yongjia um, layer instead. But um, just as a recap, looking at this data, there's also no compelling reason to set up an I in some kind of like pre um, min stage. We have a capital A that would be alongside some sort of other I that's just uh, normal. So that capital A is really only accounting for. Um, Chain system developments for a really small subset of words. Okay, um, so th both of those two finals, the, it's fairly cut and dry of what the original situation was. But when we move on to just capital A by itself, we have to consider a lot of different rhyme groups because of um, mergers and other problems. So it gets really hard to kind of um, figure out what the development would have been if, if this thing was you know, um, already behaving differently in some kind of pre-min stage. So our pharyngeal syllables with medial R or R colored um, begin to rhyme separate from the pharyngeal and uh, neutral syllables in this rhyme group at the end of the Western Han period. So we again have Koblen's study of the Chang'an rhymes. Um, but there's too few instances of this case where we have a capital A to tell if it um, rhymed separately. Um, so the, the one word that I was able to find in a poem by uh, Liu Xiang is this ye, um, that seems to rhyme with the neutral syllables. So this is, if we kind of speed up, um, this is a more O-like, um, or, or like your type of um, pronunciation than it is an ah, which is kind of the opposite of what we'd respect, uh, what we'd expect if we had like a capital A. Um, but on the other hand, in the Three Kingdoms Buddhist transcriptions, uh, it seems like almost all of the neutral syllables, including the ones that would have a capital A, would have been more A-like because they tend to transcribe Sanskrit syllables that were like that. So we have this regional divide of probably central dialect that had more of a kind of yo or yo like pronunciation versus something in the East that would have been more of a ya like pronunciation. Um, so you can see, you know, hypothetically, if these two groups to come, were to come together, we'd expect a little bit of kind of confusion of what the pronunciation of uh, at least some of these words would have been. Um, so we're going to look at neutral syllables for the yu and ho groups in uh, min. Uh, and the situation is very complicated just because there's, there's a lot of different words involved. And the, there seems to be some changes that would have been conditioned by initial. And then there's just a, a, a whole lot of finals to consider. So um, we have the uh, first, what I've highlighted here, this one is going to be the ones that correspond to our capital A. And they're very straightforward. This is just, yeah, this is kind of what we'd expect from um, a typical Chinese dialect. We have Yongan down there where the, we have a yaw like reflex instead, but that's completely regular. All, almost all the A and Yongan backs to this all like sound. We don't need to consider that. Um, the one that I've marked two here, the Y reflex is also super common as well. Um, this is probably the dominant reflex of the neutral syllable Y where we don't have the capital A in the old Chinese Baxter and Cigar reconstruction. And then we have one third group that's fairly well established, but the reflexes are a little bit bizarre and there's not many words um, where we have some kind of more of an 
e or yoi like sound in coastal min versus u and then in some cases yu in um, inland min. The reflexes for flax there are a little bit um, difficult. Uh, there's other words that demonstrate this one for the comb a lot more uh, clearly. So like chu as in like beginning has the exact same correspondences. So it's fairly well understood. What's interesting about reflex three is that it always occurs after retroflex initials in um, Cheyun system and then things that we think might have had medial R in old Chinese. Uh, there's only one word that where that's not the case. The word to scratch is something like le, um, but the correspondences for that are very difficult. So I kind of wonder if that should really be reconstructed that way or if we have enough data to be able to set it up. Um, but I think we can explain the difference between two and three and, and probably a kind of pre-min stage where maybe retroflex initials were still around. And in that case, the high like e-like vowel could very easily be lowered to more of an e-like sound. Um, retroflexion tends to uh, either back vowels or make them more open. So that seems like a natural sound change. Well, I should also point out that the retroflex initials don't tend to correspond with the, that U final either. So it's basically in complementary distribution. Um, now we have uh, some other words. We have an interesting correspondence that Norman, uh, Jerry Norman originally thought might have been irregular. So he actually reconstructed uh, at least a subset of these words with uh, finals that he thought would have went back to the old Chinese ho category. And then yu is like yu mei yuan the yu. Um, there, there's two yu and che yun. Um, one that backs right, right j-o, another one that's j-u. Um, so he would have thought it would, went back to the other one instead. Um, so uh, what Shen et al, what they demonstrated was that uh, these first two words I've written here the um, shu and jie. In this case, it may be meaning home, and then like to pad or like to spread something underneath of something else. It also means diaper. There's a bunch of different um, words that this is used in and mean. Um, both have these um, particular set of correspondences, and I know it's just two words on the one hand, but it's also because of the way the initial correspondences work, it's really convincing that these two probably came from um, a common uh, origin. It, it's nice to have at least one other word we have a clear parallel. Otherwise, this shua by itself was a little bit problematic before, because at least in the case of the, the two, so we have bu is in cloth and bu is in like to mend something. Those ones, you can at least explain the weird development with the um, bilabial initial. The, it seems like there was some kind of special behavior before like the o like vowels in. Um, in. So th those ones are understandable. Um, so it, the way Jerry Norman handled the house word originally was to actually reconstruct it as shu. And I'll, I'll um, I have a slide with the character on um, that later. It's for like, uh, border guards or like guarding, I'll, I'll show you. It's like um, yun and then like uh, gua. Um, anyway, um, right. So we still have one more character road here that it's not clear what that would have originally, what the etymology of this is. Jerry Norman thought it might be related to lu. And there are cases of this voiced D corresponding to lu. Um, like in the case of deer and then carp and a few other words in um, common mean. Um, but the final, this is a, suggests a neutral syllable with that medial and lu is, as far as we know, a pharyngeal syllable. So it's, it's not quite um, uh, regular in that sense. Uh, we'll revisit this particular correspondence in a, a minute. I've put chu on here as well. Um, even though this is, I have to be clear, is, is completely irregular. Um, even in Proto Ningdo, you can't actually reconstruct a etymon for it. Um, so, um, but 
at least the yong an reflex and then the vowel in the inland min dialects seems kind of reminiscent of the other ones so i've, I've temporarily put in this category so we don't have any velar initials um, for this particular kind of new correspondence we're looking at. Um, the nice thing about this solution is they all do belong to the U category before. Um, for the Ho group, this is the more typical correspondence. So what's important to note here is the coastal mean reflexes for both of these sets are actually the exact same. Um, it's only the inland min sets that are different. So for this particular group, we have this U um, final, while in the other one, it looks like it's more of a yo sound. Um, Jerry Norman's original solution was to say that it's possible that the inland min dialects borrowed this yo like pronunciation from like Eastern min, um, but there is, it, it, um, I, I'm not super uh, convinced that there would have been that kind of um, like situation where it, like I'm not sure what the cultural context would be for that kind of a situation to have occurred. Um, it, we'll get on to some other theories on that in a minute. Uh, the important thing to note is that this, this 4.2.3 correspondence is a lot commoner. Um, so we've had to set up a new uh, common min final. I haven't put it here. I've just put a dash for the meantime, and I'll come back to it later. Um, OK, there's a few more. So one other thing that uh, is important to note is that sometimes the whole group also corresponds to this um, you to you like set, which is normally associated with yo. So things that would have gone back to like old Chinese u. Um, so there seems to be a confusion of like the whole and yu groups for certain words as well. Um, one that I thought was kind of important to mention here is this uh, like rotting word, fu. Um, it's only in coastal Min, but it is a case where um, the, the P starting words that are in this Yu Mei Yuan, the Yu rhyme in the Cheyenne system, um, typically can go, go back to either the Yu category or to the Ho category. This one we know would have gone back to the Ho category. Um, and it has a different reflex in modern mins. So I thought it was worth putting on there. Um, the lack of the medial for that particular word is probably um, because of the initial. OK, so as you can probably see from all the different correspondence I put up, this is a very complex situation. And it's difficult to make hypotheses about the relative chronology because all of these like uh, reflexes we see kind of feel normal-ish to us. These are things that we'd expect to find in you know most Chinese dialects. I think the way Norman reconstructs the um, neutral syllables of the Ho group with a wa type of sound is maybe a little bit unusual for um, Chinese, where it tends to be have more of a front medial. Um, but if you look at like the inland min reflexes, you do get front round vowels. So nothing stands out as something that goes back to some kind of non-mainstream um, stage of Chinese. Uh, so kind of going back to what Jerry Norman was talking about with the shu for house versus shu. Um, so you can see the, the character for shu there. Uh, he was proposed in 1984 that this might have been um, a merger of the Chinese system, these are the two yu that I was talking about, merging an inland min as yu under the influence of, I should read, northern dialects. Um, so if we look at wu dialects above there, not southern wu or like the conservative versions of southern wu, but other wu dialects that are a little bit further up, they do typically merge these two finals. Um, so it's not 100% implausible that that could have been the case. Um, but then you would still have to explain why you would have the word for house in particular be this way um, if it's, I guess it's not a regular sound change because it's convergence. Um, but it's only one example. So um, in the Shen et al. paper, we have a parallel to it with this spread word. Um, and it's also nice because it parallels the reconstruction of um, 
the yo and yok. Um, and it also works in terms of lexical layers as well, because we have the later version of yok that is fronted has become a yak like of sound. And for these particular words as well, for that rhyme, so this is masan, um, or like an ya um, in common dialectal Chinese, have also, um, you know, that fronting has happened kind of parallel in both of them. So it, it seems to be a convincing solution in terms of like structural properties of, you know, how the um, layering would have worked. Um, I think there's a few things to consider though. Um, so the, the first thing to be wary is that we still only have two examples. Um, and there's other features that might explain this, what, what's going on here. So both of them have coronal initials and a departing tone. Um, so I'm not 100% sold on the idea that this yaw is necessarily like a colloquial counterpart to the masan type of rhyme or like the capital A in Baxter and Cigar's system. There might be other kind of conditioning factors here, even though I know that there's other parallels for the you group that do have coronal initials and departing tone. Um, it, it just seems like there, there might be other factors here that we still haven't really um, teased out. Then there's a debate about etymology of the road word. Um, if we knew what that was, if it really is a Chinese etymon to begin with, then that might actually shed a lot of light on this problem. And then um, another thing that I was talking about is the irregular correspondence of, go, of uh, Chu for Go having this kind of irregular correspondence that looks similar to the Yo correspondence. And if that's true, then we have a case of you know, non-capital A corresponding to this particular rhyme, um, which would suggest that we don't really need a capital A and some kind of pre-min system to derive this particular final. We could just explain it as layering. Um, and then in parallel with the U group, we have the whole group, which also has this kind of two layers as well, one that's more U-like and one that's more U slash U-like. Um, so it's not implausible to have two different layers for the neutral U group syllables as well. Um, so my tentative conclusion is that um, having this kind of capital A as a separate final from A is not the only way to, valid way to account for this new, I'm reconstructing it y'all here, um, syllable in common mean. Um, Okay, um, so it looks like I'm finishing up a little bit quickly, but that's okay, because we can leave time for questions. And um, there, there was a lot of uh, kind of data I wish I could have been able to fit better for common dialectal Chinese and other things. So if there's other points for things that were unclear, then uh, we can kind of circle back to that. Um, so in closing, the reconstructed pronunciation of uh, octophonous min vocabulary doesn't strongly suggest separate finals where the Baxter and Cigar Old Chinese ah is involved. You, it doesn't look like you know we have to resort to some kind of pre mean stage that would have had different A-like vowels or anything like that. Um, so there's speculation that this capital A comes from dialect mixture is seeming that like it, it's um, very plausible. Um, another thing that we've noticed is there's no one historical source for capital A it seems like even the one that is marked with like the AK is almost like in the different position. I mean, that that's like the normal reflex while the other ones that are marked with capital A seem to be the more unusual reflexes. So the, even the convention is a little bit, um, uh, I wouldn't say inconsistent, but it, it's uh, sometimes confusing. Um, yeah, so the, um, the variation between the two A's is probably represents dialect mixture as central speakers began to move eastward and then south. Uh, all right, so that's basically everything I wanted to present. Uh, thanks for listening and I'll uh, open the floor for any questions or clarification.